um, take it away from here. Thank you so much, Deba. I've heard a lot about you <laughs> through products that counts. It's good to see you finally. Um, and actually, coincidentally, I started my career in Boston. <laughs> I used to work at EMC Corporation, which is now Dell, uh, many, many years ago. But I've got some really good memories. Um, really good to be here, actually, and, and contribute to the product community. Um, I have given similar like speeches on similar topics um, in the UK in some of the women in product, women in tech conferences here in London. Um, and it's always good to contribute. It's always good to hear different views. Uh, please feel free to um, ask questions. I'm pretty sure at the end we will get time to answer and you know you can get in touch with me after the uh, after this event as well. Um, so I'm gonna just share my screen now. Um, and as you do that number that I would say for yeah. the audience, um, if you have questions, feel, please feel free to ask through the Q and a or the chat button. Uh, she can take questions throughout the presentation, but also at the end. Absolutely. And I'm hoping you can see my screen now, right? Yes. Okay, cool. So let me just start. Okay, so um, how to drive your product career. Um, so it's a very important topic, I think, for all of us, because product is, uh, it's not like legal or finance or accountancy, you know, where you have like a stable a structured career growth and you know you're going to be associate and then senior associate and part junior partner and partner this is not like that product can be quite different actually from other career fields um so this is just like a little snapshot view of how uh, my career has been um so i started um i'm a software engineer from india so i studied in um in a place called chennai in india and started my career in bangalore uh, which is a tech hub actually in india um, and I was my first job was in consulting. So in software consulting, I was working in a company called Wipro Technologies in Bangalore. Uh, spent around three and a half, four years in Wipro. Um, and actually through Wipro, I was um, moved to um, Boston, the EMC Corporation, which was my client that time. Ended up spending a lot of time at EMC and then made the career decision to take a break from working and, and I, I did my MBA basically. So I moved to the UK for my MBA, uh, 2011, 2012. So MBA here is a one year program. So it was a full-time MBA and that really changed my perspective quite a lot because um, from early childhood, I've been um, a science student, a typical science student. So my life is all about maths um, and physics and chemistry. Um, I, did, I don't really know much about the business side of the world. I don't See the world that way so I was never very commercial minded I think the MBA was a gift for me because I it made me think very differently um, and taught me a lot of different jobs you know like business models and propositions and, and you know how to make a company profitable and things like that so stuff that I had never actually learned before um, after graduation um, and this is very common for MBAs globally most MBAs go into consulting so, and it's the same thing that happened to me. I had offers from KPMG. I had offers from PwC. Um, and weirdly enough, for some reason, I did not want to go into consulting, actually. So I declined those offers. And um, I wanted to do something completely different. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, when people see an MBA in the CV, they generally, you know, they would generally offer me very commercial type of roles, sales role, maybe marketing in biz dev, you know, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to do that either, because I was quite a good software engineer when I, I used to code and, you know, still love doing all of that. So I want to do something where I would use my technical skills, but also my newly found business acumen. Um, and in the UK, uh, product management was not really a structured job that time. Um, every company, you know, it, the role of a product manager was not really, it was more of a technical marketing type of role. It was more like go to market, that type of role. Um, it wasn't actually about building products. You know, building was always product development team, which used to be under IT, actually. It's a very different vibe. Um, and this is, I'm talking about 2012 now, which is, you know, more than 10, 11 years ago now, right? So the world has changed quite a lot. Um, still, I was quite determined. I somehow found uh, my first job after... MBA, I mean, I did my internship at Kellogg's, which is an um, FMCG company, as you might know, here in Manchester. So I did my um, internship there in the business intelligence team. And then when I found my first job in London, um, it was uh, it was a business analyst role, uh, but more of a PO kind of a role. It was a product owner-ish role. 
And I did my scrum certification and all that that time so that I know how agile works and stuff like that. So kind of more or less my first job after MBA was a PO job, role of a product owner, very different from everybody else in my class. So most of my friends from MBA are consultants, even today. I probably I was the only one who did, who did something completely different. And that was considered to be risky by a lot of people um, and quite strange, actually, in many ways. Um, but I think for me, it, it paid off. I think that's the reason I'm, I'm giving this, um, you know, speech today. So 2013 is where my career actually started. It was, um, I was in a large tel um, telco company. Telecom is, a, is quite a complicated sector, as some of you might know. So the learning was very good. I learned a lot about product management and how to build regulated products because it's a highly regulated industry. Um, and then since then, I mean, in this kind of picture, what you will see is um, how I have climbed the ladder. So it's been quite fast for me. Uh, it's taken me around seven, eight years to get to the CPO role, which is probably quite fast, uh, I would say. Um, but again, it's been pretty hectic as well. So it's fast, but it's fast for a reason. Um, I mean, as I moved ahead in my in my career, so right from a PO, I kind of moved to more of a SPM type role, the senior product manager, product lead role. Um, and I was working in a media company. Um, again, it was actually a New York based media company, but with offices in London. That was a great experience. And it was like a mid-sized thousand people type of organization, uh, private equity owned. Uh, and that, you know, that taught me quite a lot because there was a transformation angle to it. Um, product in larger companies is actually a transformation role as product managers or product people are the change agents. You know, we always have the tough job uh, as, as you guys might know, right? So it was, again, tough jobs means it teaches you more, right? So the tougher the job you take, the more you will grow um, as a professional. And that's exactly what happened to me. Um, so that role taught me a lot. Um, and I kind of fell in love with the media industry as well. It was my first time and I really loved it. Um, and in this picture, you will see there are little symbols that I have given, you know, like there is a little symbol there of, a, you know, the, the graduation sign. It's because I did extra courses and programs as well. So 2015, I did um, a, a program on strategy at um, University of Cambridge. I think that helped me quite a lot. Again, kind of strategic thinking and how to kind of come up with a product vision strategy, things like that. And some of these things have really helped me. I will talk more about it later in the slides, but you know, learning, self-learning, investment in myself, that has been a huge theme for me uh, throughout my career even today. Um, and as you can see from the product lead type of role, I moved into a head of product role at a, a small startup back then called um, Babylon Health, which um, probably is not a small startup anymore. It's a public company now, and they're very heavy in the US. So some of you might have heard of Babylon quite a life-changing experience for me. I was um, I was a second product person at Babylon. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was just, it was life-changing in many ways, actually. Um, I got to build products that nobody had built before. Babylon was not just disrupting a market. It was actually creating a market that time. And the market was about digital GP, digital doctors. That market did not actually exist before. So again, that gave me an opportunity to kind of learn a lot of things, you know, and experiment um, a lot, which is, you know, very important for product managers. It was also the first time I had ever worked in a startup. So before that, all my experience has been in, in, in big or mid-sized corporates. Um, Babylon was my first startup. They were very small when I joined. We were around 50 people. Um, and also it was the first time I ever worked in a company with mobile apps. So I had never worked on mobile before. It was always web-based products that I had worked on. Um, so a lot of first times, it was also my first time working in a B2C product. So before that, all my experience were in B2B. So a lot of diff disruption, a lot of different things happened to me that year, I would say quite a different year for me. And then after that, my next uh, promotion was again, quite fast, 2017. I got a job of a senior director of product at a company called Viacom, which is now rebranded as Paramount. Uh, Viacom is a big media conglomerate with brands like MTV, Nickelodeon, um, Paramount Studios, et cetera, et cetera. Very popular in the US. So if you're in the US, of course, you know about all about Viacom. Um, a great role for me. I was heading up Europe, uh, heading up product for the whole of Europe for 26 brands. Huge remit, biggest remit probably since till then, and big year for me. I also had my first child that year in 2017. So again, big year from a career perspective, but also personally, a really, really big year for me. I will speak. Um, I'm I'm hoping and guessing there's few women in the in the audience as well. So I will talk a bit about like career breaks and things like that as well later in the slides. 
Um, and then 2020 um, is when, of course, COVID hit, media industry struggled quite a lot. Um, and I was quite, um, I was really happy at Viacom, to be honest, but I was also thinking, right, you know, a lot of exciting projects were actually stopped that time because of uncertainty caused by uh, COVID, you know, so, um, and that's the same year that I got um, approached for a, a CPO role um, at a health, a small health company, quite small, about 100 employees. Um, and I thought that's a good opportunity because, you know, I had a health experience in Babylon and I thought, you know, working in a health company during COVID, it's quite a good career story. So I was quite excited. I took the role um, and that was quite an exciting role, actually. Um, again, a smallish company, but the remit was really good. Um, so I led the uh, product teams, product and engineering teams design, et cetera, et cetera. And we built, you know, triage and a bunch of different softwares, which is actively used by NHS uh, primary care. Again, high impact. And, and since then, actually, since COVID, my vision for my career has changed quite a lot as well. I'm more inclined towards working with um, industries that have high impact on people. So healthcare, education, you know, edu industries, which are like kind of tech for good in a way. So that has been my theme since um, since COVID. And I'm sure many of you in the audience must have had some life-changing experiences during that time as well. Um, so again, that was a great year for me. And actually, I got the chance to go back to Boston 2020 as well. This is uh, before COVID. This was Feb 2020. I did a leadership program at Harvard Business School. Um, it was an amazing program. I was there for about a month um, at the Harvard campus. And yeah, quite a life-changing experience for me. But also um, that program was really about readiness for the C-suite role. Um, so I was quite fortunate that I did the program and actually got the C-suite role in the same year. Um, so again, amazing, amazing experience um, and, and something that I would really cherish. Um, and then come 2022, um, this was last year, January, I got um, another, my second CPO role uh, for a large education company. So currently that's where I work. It's called Into, International, uh, Into University Partnerships. Uh, we work with the top 100 universities in the world. So we've got about 20 plus university partnerships in the US and similar number in the UK and a few in Australia as well. Um, again, this is a big role for me and it's slightly different from the other CPO roles, from the previous CPO role, because this is, I also have a much broader remit. I've got parts of marketing, research, um, insights, functions reporting into me. I also have our startup incubator reporting into me as well. So it's a, it's a broad remit. And actually that has been the theme in my career, most of the jobs. It's not just a change in job title, it's also been a change in remit as well. So I've always tried to do more and more and more with, with every job, which is personally stressful for me, but also amazing learning opportunity. Um, last, last year was also very, very special because I had my, my second child uh, by the end of last year. So yeah, so this has been like my journey so far. Um, we, we, I don't know what comes next, but as of now, I'm, I'm extremely happy with Intu. Um, I can't see your questions. If you have any questions at this point, I'm happy to answer if someone can help me reading it out. Yeah, and no questions so far, Namrata. Okay, good, cool. I'll just, I'll continue. Um, so what did I do differently? I think this is important, right? Um, and I really, I really wish somebody had told me some of these things. <laughs> Nobody did at that point. Um, I did not actually follow any convention. You know, I did not follow the expected route. The expected route, um, if you're an MBA, is consulting. <laughs> I did not follow that, uh, which was risky, which was seen as a very risky decision at that point, actually. Because an MBA is very expensive, as you can imagine, and I had a lot of loan and all that to pay back. And a lot of people were like, oh, my God, doing different things. And I was like, fine, it's my life. I'll, I'll experiment. I'll gamble. Let's see what happens. Um, I also entered product management at a time when it was a very small, undefined um, field. Uh, at least in the UK, it wasn't defined at all. I mean, you will hardly see PO roles, like product owner, product manager roles, you'll hardly ever see. Um, and even if you see a role like that, it's not actual product management. It's more like a marketing role or a commercial role, you know. So this is this was very new that time. So I think that is a good thing I did by jumping into this very early um, in, the, in the cycle. Um, I also focus on emerging roles rather than established ones, which means that um, rather than going for roles, which are like, let's say that time, like project management, program management, these are very common uh, roles, you know, and I didn't go for these things. So I focus more on skill sets that would be um, relevant in the future. 
you know, and that time with all the articles, et cetera, I read, um, all, all the articles were hinting towards the growth in product management in large organizations. I mean, startups were already having these roles, but even in large companies, everybody was saying that, right, the, you know, there will be CPOs in companies, there will be, you know, big banks will become product focused, you know, all of these are big predictions that time. So I learned from that and I, f I figured that, you know, I'll, I'll let me go for emerging roles rather than roles which are already popular. I also prioritize long-term gains um, over short-term profits. I can tell more about this in the later slides. Took a lot of risk, uh, goes without saying, experimented a lot, changed sectors a lot. I mean, in the UK, um, it's not common to change sectors. In the UK, generally, you'll see most profiles, um, experts in one area. So you're like a banking product person or you're like an education product, but I moved across various sectors, some regulated, some not. And I think that taught me a lot. Um, and also working in complex sectors, you know, because I've always felt whenever I have worked in healthcare, for example, or telco, I've learned more because these are complicated sectors, multiple stakeholders. Um, it's, it's, it's high risk, like I would say high stress in a way for a PM, but also you learn just a lot. You know, so I've always focused on more kind of compl complex roles. Um, I've also always focused on impact rather than size of the role and team. I mean, I've had roles where um, my, my team size is pretty small, but that doesn't really bother me much. I'm more focused on the impact, like what is the value my team and me have on the company rather than how many people do I manage? Um, also, there are certain things that I wanted to mention, things that really benefited me, actually. Um, being active in the community, you know, what I'm doing right now, I, being active in the product and tech community since early career is, is very important. Um, often I see, you know, around me that uh, people tend to get more active as they kind of climb the ladder. You know, once you become a head of a director, that's when you're like start to be a bit more active and speak at events and panels and whatnot. In my case, I started this whole thing very early, actually. So right from the time I was a PM, I was very active in the community visit, you know, I would be there for most of the product events and conferences, but I also would find myself a seat at the panel, you know, so I started all of this quite early, which, which I think benefited me. Um, a lot of upskilling and self-learning, um, books, courses, training, you know, all, you name it, I've, I've done it. Again, being really proactive with your career is important. And this is something I advise my own staff, my own team as well, is that your career is actually nobody's business. It's your own business, you know? So um, you're lucky if you have an employer who's ready to fund, uh, you know, courses for you or training, et cetera, for you. That's actually a bonus. You're really lucky if, if, if your employer does that, but you should not expect that, you know? You should do that nonetheless. If nobody is funding courses for you, you should fund yourself um, because ultimately being proactive in your career is, is it will give you the return, you know, later on. Um, most of my roles, I've always owned um, vision, strategy, execution, all three things. Um, again, I think for product people, it's very important to be good at all of these things. Um, I have, um, you know, I know this, you know, if you look at the market, there are people who are more kind of strategic people, and then there are people who are like delivery people. Um, my advice, what I did myself was I did not stick to any stereotype. I'm not a strategic only or an execution only person. I do the whole thing. So the vision, strategy, execution, I am good at all of these. And I try to be very good at all of these because I think it ultimately benefits me. Even as a CPO today of, of a large organization with a large team, I try to be as hands-on as possible with my products because I think it's important for me to know how my products run and what are the shortcomings. Um, so again, this has worked for me so far. Um, broad experience set. So again, B2B, B2C, my advice would be do all of them if you get the chance. Um, I've, I, I often see profiles um, where, you know, someone has only done B2B product management or someone has done only B2C. My advice would be do both if you get the chance. Because you just, you need to have diverse perspectives as a, as a product person, especially if you want to become a CPO at some point, you just never know what, where you end up and what type of products you end up leading and managing, you know? So having that broad experience set is important, but also the type of companies, you know? So if you've worked in corporates all your life, you know, maybe try a startup next time, you know, you might not like it, maybe you love it, but it's worth trying. You will just never know unless you try so again, having that multiple perspective, you know, startup, SMEs, corporations, like it's good to have that diversity of experience. 
in your CV because that actually makes your CV extremely um, attractive. Um, and the last thing is I've worked on transformations as well as new market innovations. Um, most often what you will find is a, a senior leadership role in a, in a large corporate is actually a transformation role. So my current role, even though I'm a CPO, I'm actually a transformation CPO. Um, and that's a given. If you want to stick to a large-ish company type thing in your life, you will end up doing transformation. That's just no, there's no other way to it. Um, but again, similarly, if you want to try something else, it might be good to kind of, you know, go for a scale up or a startup where you might be working on new market innovations. So in my case, Babylon was one such example, new product, new market, new industry, really. Um, you know, there was not much of digital health tech that time, especially in the UK. Um, but my last two or three roles um, have been very transformational. So I would call them transformation role rather than new product development. Um, hey, and, I remember that one question that has come okay. up, maybe you want to answer. Um, how do you get into startups when you get rejected prior to the interview stage because of your enterprise experience? That is such a good, that is such a good example, right? I, and I'm happy to kind of double click on that later, you know, with you. Um, so it happened to me. Um, so when I was um, at a media company, I said, right, it's not enterprise, like thousand plus employees. And I was interviewing at Babylon. I was so just ran, I was like, I was in a suit. I mean, <laughs> I was in a business suit. I was so formal. Um, and I go to Babylon and everybody's in shorts and hoodies. And it's a completely different vibe. I was a bit taken aback, I have to be honest. Um, I think, you know, it's hard because um, it, it, there are two sides of the coin, you know. There are startups who really value enterprise experience, especially if they are in a series B, C, D, that type of stage, because that is the stage where the startup has achieved um, product market fit. And that's when they really want experienced people in the company who can show them direction and processes and stuff like that, you know. Um, that's when they look for enterprise talent. They look for people from enter enterprise backgrounds. So I would say um, if you've always worked in a corporate, maybe going to a seed stage or series A stage startup could be a bit too radical, even for you, like from a culture fit perspective. But I think a series C, a series B, C, D, that would be perfect. You will be wanted in that kind of a company. The other thing is um, always have, try to do side projects, I would say, you know. So let's say if your ambition is to really work to break into the startup scene, but let's say nobody is selecting your CV for some reason, try to do advisory roles or maybe get on a board of a startup. Like it could be your friend's startup or your family, you know. So just within your circle, within your community, find ways where you can say in your CV that actually, apart from my day job, I have been working with these little this little startup and helping them with their product strategy or whatever. So sometimes these kind of side projects help you land a new role as well, because you can always say that, listen, I've been in corporates because that's been my career trajectory. However, I love startups so much that I'm doing this on the side, you know, and it could be a pro bono. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a paid role or whatever. It could be a pro bono, right? But that could land you that dream startup job that you've been wanting to. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. No, that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to uh, tap now on just like management and individual contributor. And, and this is a question I get a lot. Um, it is very much possible, by the way. I mean, I know there's a lot of flat organizers, especially tech companies tend to be really flat. Um, and you might be thinking, gosh, I'm still an individual contributor. I haven't become a manager yet. I'm not becoming a team leader. What's going to happen? Actually, don't worry much about it because uh, organizations are becoming more and more flat now. I mean, you've seen now the, the latest kind of meta, their new strategy and all that, right? So, I mean, companies, big companies or small, they are actually looking at more flatter structures than hierarchical because it really speeds up decision-making, you know? And it is very much possible to grow as a um, IC, provided you are a specialist in a certain field. So it just that depends on your skill set. Um, I would say if, you, if your skill becomes very generic, generalist, that might be a problem. So always try to keep your skill set a bit more specific, you know? So you need to have some superpower. So let's say you're a PM, um, whose superpower is marketplaces or your PM whose superpower is subscription products, you know? So those are the little superpowers. So it doesn't matter, even if you're an IC, you can actually really do very well in your career because you've got those specialist um, skills in you. 
Um, and as I said, structures are becoming flatter. So I, I don't think, you know, just be, just by being a people manager can sometimes actually be a problem, you know? Um, so again, skill, having that skill is, is very important. Um, also being hands-on um, can make you recession-proof, I would say, and reorg-proof, I, I like to call it. And this year is a testament. I mean, if you look around you, companies, especially in the US, um, in the Valley, so much going on, right? Every company is going to restructuring, including the UK, by the way. Um, but, you know, if, if you are needed in the company for your specialist skills, you could be safe, you know, or if you're hands-on. So I would say hands-on, being hands-on is, is back in fashion, you know, be, be hands-on as much as you can. I mean, even as a CPO, I try to be really hands-on as much as I can because A, it keeps my brain alive um, and B, it just keeps me relevant in the market. Um, good leadership can galvanize product teams and it can result in, in superior products. So again, that goes back to team management. So again, becoming a good leader. And, you know, I think those skills are very important for a product person. Um, also, as a leader, you must ensure that, um, you know, your team and you build high performance teams that are judged by the impact and not the size. Um, again, that goes back to the whole rationale that, okay, I only have a small team. I'm not important enough. That's completely false, by the way. You could have a team of, 10 very average people, or you could have a team of two absolute rock stars. I would take a team of two rock stars any day, you know, so, so always focus on the impact. No, I think the size and all those things doesn't, you know, doesn't really matter. Um, this goes back to one of the questions I had, right? Startups, corporations, again, ex try to gain experience in both. Um, if startups are not taking you for, because of your extensive corporate experience, try to gain startup experience as a side gig like a side hustle pro bono, you know, so all of that would add to your career. Similarly, I, I often meet a lot of people who've only been in startups, um, don't ever want to work in a large company. I, I think that is not right as well. I think if you've been a startup all your life, you can easily become very stereotyped. Okay, this is a startup person. This is a startup PM. Don't get stereotyped. That would be, you know, my advice. So if you've always worked in startup, again, try to get into the corporate world somehow. A lot of companies, including us, we have our own like ed tech incubator arm. Um, uh, search for companies like that, which are probably large companies, but they have like a, a little incubator going on or a little innovation hub going on and try to get roles in those type of innovation hubs who will take you with open arms, you know? So then it gives you that, you know, experience in a, in a larger corporate. So I would say try to have that experience, multiple, you know, multifaceted experience. I'd also say that if you are hiring managers, if they're hiring managers in the audience, um, I guess a lot depends on you as well, actually, because um, hiring managers can make a big difference by being open about diversity of experience. You know, um, it's, a, it's a risk worth taking, right? I mean, the reason I could um, work like toggle between startups and corporates, it's only because somebody took a chance on me. Somebody took a risk, right? And I, I'm really thankful to that person. So I would say if you're a hiring manager, be a bit open-minded, take risk, you know, do hire people who are from, uh, you know, diverse experiences, you know, you will see the benefit. If they are smart, they will really add value. Um, also, startup culture and lean working principles can be a game changer for large corporations. So because um, because I've worked in startup and I know the value, what I have done at Into, and I've been here for one and a half years, um, one and a half years now, is I have actually a lot of the people, new people that I've hired in my team are from startups, startups and scale-ups. Um, it's because I know that they work faster. They get things faster. They get things done. So I've hired a lot of people either from startups or people who have like a startup mentality, you know, and believe in lean working principles. So again, I would say those things uh, can really help you as well in building um, a high performing team that would ultimately make you look good um, as a leader. Um, career pivots. Well, um, first of all, I... A career break is not a taboo anymore. Maybe it was a few years ago. At the moment, I don't think so. Um, and I think breaks, um, I mean, I've had, well, I won't say breaks, but of course, because of uh, my, you know, because of having two kids, I've had two maternity breaks. It wasn't as long as I had wanted it to be, quite small breaks, but still it's been a break, but it's been good for me, to be honest. You know, it gave me the rest that I really needed. And I would say the breaks uh, can be used um, working on side hustles. Like you might have a career break because let's say you got redundant and you did not get a job because of a bad market. You might have a gap in your CV for like six months, let's say. Now, how do you turn that six months into your advantage rather than a, a disadvantage? That really is up to you. 
I would say always keep an eye on side hustles, passion projects, community work. You know, you might have some new business ideas or you you might want to learn a new skill. I mean, I just met somebody recently, a very senior person who's on a break now, a transition now, and she is now learning AI. She has nothing to do with tech, by the way. She's she's come from she comes from a commercial background. She's learning AI because she thinks that that's the skill of the future and she just wants to be ahead of the curve. And she's a very senior person. She's a C-suite. So that's just an amazing example of how you can really use your your breaks, career breaks or gaps to your advantage, you know, to actually uh, make your CV uh, or resume better. Uh, I sometimes also feel that pivots can sometimes be a blessing as well, because maybe you were always in the wrong field. You know, um, I see a lot of like, especially during COVID, I saw a lot of people who moved away from travel industry and, and actually a lot of people have entered education and other sectors. And when I speak to them now, they say they will never go back <laughs> to the previous. So for them, that pivot actually worked, you know, so sometimes pivoting your career actually helps you, you know, in many ways. Um, I also feel that career change can be really empowering if you are very clear about the purpose. And ultimately, I think, especially in leadership roles and when you select leadership roles, Purpose is very important. You know, what's the purpose of you in this world, but also in this organization? Like, what is your value? You know, and you really want what type of company do you want or industry do you want to add value in? So I would say keeping these things in mind is also very important for career success. Um, Work-life integration. Uh, for those of you with, you know, with family, young kids, or maybe grown-up kids, I mean, work-life integration is important. I think especially in the U.S., because I've worked in the U.S., I know the working culture is uh, hectic, probably more hectic than U.K. Um, but, you know, it's, it is possible to find... Uh, I, I, that's why I don't use the word balance, <clears throat> because I have to be honest, as you grow higher up the ladder, the balance becomes... There is no real balance. It's more of an integration. You have to integrate your work and your your, your personal life. You know, it has to be well integrated so that you can deliver value um and you know that right hand side what i'm you know what, the, the the diagram that you see now actually that i have taken from the leadership program i did at harvard um in 2020 and this was a really really good this really you know i found it really interesting because to me this seems like the perfect balance uh, where you have your work you've got your home life you've got your community life and then you've got your well-being and health Right. So you've got these four kind of these little nice Venn diagram that really kind of um, explains how you can have a balanced life and career. I think for me, that's important. And this is how I try to lead my life. Um, you know, it's not just work, work, work. There is a lot of personal things as well. And there is community building. But at the same time, making sure that mental and physical health are equally balanced and they get the care that um, they need. Um, and I feel it is possible to integrate all of these things without making uh, big sacrifices. Uh, building a support network around you is very important. Um, personally, I have found mentors to be very important, very, really, really enabling in my life. Um, and also being active in the community. I mean, I, I, I will tell more about it in my next slide, but community has really, really helped me in my life, throughout my life, you know, mainly the product and tech community that I have built here in, in London. Um, I've learned so much from the community and the community has al always helped me in finding that balance. Um, always forward plan, I would say, especially if you want to really integrate work life. Um, forward planning can be a real blessing. Um, also learn to delegate if you've got big teams or even small teams. Learn, you know, it's good to empower your teams, your direct reports always. Give them opportunities where they can shine. Take a step back if needed, which actually can be a good, a, a, a blessing for you, you know, so because you can then have, you can relax for a little bit. So kind of the, uh, the delegation is also a bit of an art. And this is something which is uh, very important for um, a leader. And lastly, don't hesitate to dream big. Um, I would say it is possible to have quite a hectic, busy career um, and manage everything else as well. It, nothing is impossible. Um, and my advice is not to hesitate to dream big, because I think if you dream, it actually it actually happens. <laughs> um, this is my last slide, um, and it's about community building. I stress a lot on this because, I mean, of course, the products that count is a community as well. It's a huge, it's a very, very big community. And again, the organizers have been have done this for the value or for the benefit of the community. So you see the value immediately. 
Um, so I started, so there are three kind of, the two communities that I'm extremely proud about. One is um, the one I started during my, mater my first maternity leave. I started the Career Moms Club um, in London, which is now, it's a community of around 2000 working mothers in London. And, and these are women, you know, there's doctors, lawyers, bankers, you know, all sorts of people. Um, and we are a very close knit group. It's a Facebook group, but we also have WhatsApp and LinkedIn and stuff like that. But it's mainly a Facebook group. Um, and yeah, it, it, that that community has been growing organically. The 2000 women that we have, I've never ever done any promotions or anything like that. It's all very organic. So that has grown steadily. Um, and during lockdown, um, I started the Women in Product UK um, which is a very vibrant community. It's it's full of you know current and aspiring product uh, female product professionals in the UK. This community is growing as well. Um, you know, it's only started a few years ago, um, and there's a lot. We do a lot of events. We do a lot of panels. We do a lot of different things, um, and we are quite close knit as well because um, women in in product is very few and far actually. It's, it's quite a small number, um, especially CPOs. There's not many female CPOs. Um, in the UK, it's very tiny. I'm guessing in the US, the numbers are slightly bigger. Still, it's it's not balanced. It's quite small. Um, and lastly, I do coaching and mentoring as well. I think most people like me who are in a leadership role, uh, you know, kind of start mentoring and coaching at, at a certain level. I do exactly the same whenever I get the time. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, you can reach out to me. I've got my own website. Um, but yeah, I'm always happy to coach and mentor product people who are who have high ambitions who are making their way into leadership roles because product re product leadership roles are not easy uh the chief product officer role is still very new in a lot of companies especially um, in corporates and when you're the newest exec uh it's never easy it's actually quite hard um and i understand the hardships because i've been through it uh, so i try my best to kind of you know um share my skill sets with others as much as i can uh, and that that gives me a lot of happiness um, in return. Um, yeah, with that, I think that is it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Namrata, so much. Uh, that was very, very insightful. And thank you for sharing so much of your kind of personal journey and stories. I don't see any questions yet, uh, but the audience, please feel free to ask the questions in the chat or Q&A um, box. But until you do, uh, Namrata, maybe a few questions from my side. Um, yeah. Based in UK, obviously a lot of our audience is both in US, UK, and globally. Uh, what have you seen in the recent past in terms of role of product managers, role of product leaders or CPOs? How has that evolved in UK or Europe? It's evolved a lot, um, you know, because I am not biased. Like I've worked in the US and UK both. So I'm not biased at all. I'll be really honest. I think the US is ahead in terms of the, the, the curve, you know? Um, and I think the role of the product manager in the US is probably a bit more mature in many ways. Um, in the UK, I mean, 10 years ago, when I was just out of business school, product managers were actually go-to-market people. So they were like commercial people, you know? So they wouldn't know what's a scrum or agile. They wouldn't know that. It's more like um, kind of launch collaterals and it's very commercial, commercial role, right? Um, now it's changed. I mean, I think the whole role changed kind of eight, nine years ago now. Um, and now I think the role is more technical, actually, which is what it should be, I think. Um, and that's why I think somebody like from my profile with a computer science background really benefits, you know, because um, even like chief product officers, if you see a few years ago, but not technical people at all. And these were not technical roles. Now, when you know, when I interviewed for the CPO role, the first thing was like, okay, are you technical? They want a technical CPO. Um, I've also seen that CPO and CTO roles are merging. And this is happening in the US as well. I am aware of that. Um, so the CPTO role is merging, is emerging, especially if if you have a CPO who is from an engineering background, um, a lot of companies are trying to make it like more of a CPTO role. So I think there are differences that way. I think the, the product manager role in the US historically has been quite technical. In the UK, that wasn't the case, but I think now it's becoming more and more technical. Got it, thank you so much. Uh, we do have a question from uh, Talia Marino. Her question is, thanks for the great insight, Namrata. I think I heard you mention that in your current CPO role, or maybe in your previous CPO role that you 
you also oversee the engineering teams. So what are your thoughts on engineering reporting into CPO or product versus product reporting into CTO? <laughs> um, product reporting to CTO is a complete no. <laughs> I think Deva will, uh, will agree with me, right? <laughs> yes, yes, that's not product. It's a deal breaker <laughs> for us, right? Um, that's a complete deal breaker. I think that used to happen, you know, in, in back in the days, probably, but now I don't, uh, that should not happen. Um, I think, again, it really, I think the CPTO role or combining these roles or letting the CPO manage engineering, I think there are two big factors. Um, one is, um, the size of your company, uh, three big factors, actually. First is the size of your company. So if it's a company with 50 people, 60 people, honestly, I wouldn't bother having a separate CTO, CPO. It doesn't make sense. You know, I would combine the roles. Financially, it makes more sense for the board uh, to do that, right? So it's, if it's a small company or even a company of 1,000 people, let's say, I think combining these roles just financially, logistically makes sense, right? Uh, in a large company, if you're 10,000, 20,000 employees, it can be hard. You know, because each the CTO and a CPO might have staff of 300 or whatever, right? Now, if you combine, it becomes staff of five, 600. It's a lot. It's a lot of people. So size of the company matters. The second thing is, what is the product? I think the product matters a lot. Um, if it is like, let's say, a, a deep tech company, it's an AI product. I think you do need a very technical CTO. Super technical. Now, if I'm being offered um, a CPTO role at a deep tech AI company, will I take it? Probably no. You know, because I'm not that type of technical. I've, my coding experience was like more than 10 years ago now. I haven't coded, you know, recently. Um, but like if it is a CPTO role at an e-commerce company or a marketplace company, I can easily do that. It's very easy for me to do that. So again, the type of product matters. And the third thing is the skill of the person. You know, I mean, if you look at, if you go through CPO profiles, you will still not find too many CPOs who are coming, who come from a tech background, actually. So if you find such a candidate who is a CPO, but comes from a computer science or a tech background, I think he or she can do that job quite easily. But if it's a CPO coming from, let's say, marketing background, or let's say a content background, I think it'll be hard for them to do that combined role, you know? So it really depends on these three things. I think at no circumstances, product should report to CTO. Uh, I don't see that happen very often, but if it's still happening, that should stop. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'll add my perspective. Totally agree. I think I think that used to happen more often. I think yeah. if that happens, that role becomes more, I call like a call like a product owner role where you're just kind of executing yeah. and you're typically not very close to the business or customers, which is the reason why even we started with the PM roles to, to yeah. the place. So, so you're going to defeat the purpose. But yeah, I, I see, I, I agree with you, Number that I think the CPTO roles, um, to add to what you said, I think the CPO or the product teams, they really add a lot of value thinking about customers and the business and the future and the market and those things. And in many companies, the technology has become mature enough that that itself is not driving all those things. And that's a factor uh, versus yeah. to your point, like some deep tech companies where the tech is the product yeah. and uh, and maybe you are building products for tech people. And yes. then the CTO could actually have much better understanding of the customer landscape and the market landscape much effectively. So I think it kind of makes up both, but I see the CPT roles come more and more, especially... Yeah you know, having one person control both sides and make the right decision from that perspective. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the, uh, <coughs> you know, the <coughs> sorry, the, the kind of the coordination can take a lot of time, right? Because the CPO and the CTO, when you make joint decisions, it's generally a joint decision, which means that these two people have to be partners almost, right? And partnerships, as we all know, is very hard. <laughs> it's very hard mm -hmm. to find solid partnerships, you know? So if it works like a dream, I think it's good for the board and the CEO. But if it's not working, it might be better to just think how you can merge these roles. Yeah, great. Uh, I have one more question from uh, Swati Awasti. Uh, hi, Nam. Uh, thank you for sharing your very awesome journey with us. At this point, how do you describe the difference between a CTO and the CPO role based on the big ticket decisions they make? That's a great question. Uh, actually, you know what, Deva, I'd love to hear from you as well. I'd love to hear your perspective because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm guessing it, it might be similar, it could be different. 
I think the CTO, I would expect a CTO to make uh, deep architectural decisions, you know? So let's say I'm, I want to build a, a platform XYZ and I'm deciding the code, the, the stack, the tech stack, you know? Should it be in React, should it be in Angular or whatever, or Vue or whatever. So if I want to select what scripting language I'm gonna use, I would really expect the CTO to make that decision, you know? Um, and then, come, you know, the, the cybersecurity stuff, compliance, data centers, um, cloud, all of that infrastructure, I will expect, I would expect a CTO to solid, like make that decision. When it comes to um, who is the user of the product, what's the product market fit, what features are most likely to be used by the customer, what is the best market for this product, those kind of decisions is completely product. Right, I wouldn't expect a CTO to make those decisions, right? Um, or if you have to make a decision in terms of what will stick with a customer, what should we build, what should add more value, I would expect the CPO to make that decision. That's not a tech decision. Um, so I think the, the roles can be really distinct, but the problem is it's very easy to step in each other's shoes. It, it, it can happen actually, right? But I think from my, if I look at it from an unbiased land, lens, I feel like the roles are actually quite distinct. Yeah, I agree. So I'll add my perspective in addition to that. I think, yeah, in, in some situations, like whether it is a customer focused product decision, market focused or business focused features or products. I think it's it's very um, black and white. I think the CPO should make the decision. If this is much more of architectural uh, infrastructure, security, uh, or even hiring of the talent, like in the technical talent yeah. and technical compensation, technical growth of the path, I think, I think those things are in the purview of a CTO. I think there it gets into a gray area where things get mixed, where let's say a platform decision and a product decision start to become uh, conflicting or they are synonymous or they're kind of together and it becomes hard in those situations, especially, you know, again, different companies that if you're a large company, they're typically going through transformation and the transformation is happening both from customer business perspective, but also from a technical and platform perspective. Yeah. And it gets into that kind of conflict or kind of making the right balancing choices. I think in the startup world, like especially when you're actually scaling, it yeah. gets into how much you invest in scaling of platforms and the infrastructure versus um, <laughs> versus scaling of the product and the market. Yeah. And it, it's still the same budget and funds. I think funding and, and those kind of choices becomes a little tricky. I, I think the best way is to handle through partnership and collaboration. I don't think there is any easy way. Um, but but yeah, I think that's probably, to be honest, I think the CPO role, sometimes you have similar conflicts with other roles yes. in business <laughs> where it may not, may not be you know, 100% distinct all the time. Yeah, it's very, I think, the <clears throat> because it, as I say, it's the newest role in the exec. When you're the new newest role in the exec, it's a problem. <laughs> yes. you know? And I think that's why the personality matters a lot. And often I see that CPOs really need to be quite thick skinned. If you are very, um, if you take everything to heart, if you take everything personally, you just, you might not survive in that role. You have to be quite strong actually. And you need to have strong arguments because you need to support and protect your team all the time, you know? Um, so I think there are all these kind of things, um, but also like, you know, from one of my previous jobs, and this is hilarious, right? Because we were thinking of, we're in a scale up mode. And I was like, right, the app is going to be used by around hundred million people and blah, blah, blah. So from a product perspective, I'm obviously extremely excited when I'm saying this, my board is jumping, as you can imagine, the CTO on the other hand is like, oh my God, because he's thinking about the infrastructure the security you know the, he he has different issues like different problems you know so sometimes it's quite hilarious the dynamic actually because um, what keeps you awake in the night is very different for the cpo and the cto you know um and i think that's the joy of working in a company like this but again as i said um i think the future of the cpo role and you know i'm kind of in prediction mode now i think you will see more and more combined roles in the future um, you know, or you will see CPOs taking up additional duties as well. I also see CPOs or product leadership roles becoming more GM type roles, actually. 
where you own the PL, the entire PL of your product, and you decide the pricing of your product, in fact, you know. So that level of ownership and power I can imagine for the product roles in the future. So well, let's hope uh, that actually happens. But I think that's the that's what's gonna happen in the next few years. Yeah, no, totally agree. I think CPO, um, I would say the C-suite is the most cross-functional role compared to any other function. So I think they kind of lend itself to expand some roles into different other areas because it's not that difficult for them to actually take that on. And more and more, I also see like PL roles. Like how do you actually own more PL and get into sales and operations and other things as well in addition to product? But uh, Namrata, thank you so much for joining. I know we're running out of time now, but this was super helpful for our audience. I'm sure they learned a lot. Uh, if folks have questions, I'm sure you can reach out to Namrata through the links she provided. This will be all recorded and posted soon, but thank you so much for joining our webinar. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for coordinating. Bye-bye. All, right, all right. Thank you, everyone. Bye.